Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Um, as I mentioned, I'll sort of toward uh, from now until the end of the uh, course, I'll try and give you a few hints and tricks for uh, your final project. As I'm sure you've all realized by now, working with physics engines can be a little bit finicky sometimes, so we will do our best. Um, I put up uh, last week this new version of PyroSim that has these two additional features. Uh, one of those two features is to uh, respect collisions between pairs of objects rather than just an object and uh, the ground. Some of you have noticed that there's an issue with this, which is if your robot uh, brings two objects into contact with one another, what often happens? There's self-collision. The exploding, the, the good old exploding robot trick, right? Why does the robot explode when two or more objects that make up the body come into contact with one another? Is it like one space into the other one? And like can't accept that? It can't accept that. Why, why not? What does the underlying physics engine underneath PyroSim, which is Open Dynamics Engine, or ODE, what does it do when two objects come into contact with one another that are not supposed to interpenetrate? How does it resolve that issue? It applies forces opposing it, right? So it detects where the objects touch and what is the direction of force pushing those two objects towards one another. So ODE will apply small forces, let's say it's two of the lower legs that come into contact with one another. If they, if they come into contact, it applies a small force pushing those pairs of objects apart. What happens at the next time step? What gets stronger? Which, which forces? Are they the ones that are interpenetrating? Possibly. So when two independent objects, if you have two objects that are falling and they hit the ground and they roll towards one another and they touch, the physics engine applies two small forces pushing those objects apart and everything's fine. Why are things not fine when it's two objects that make up the body coming into contact with one another? They're held together by joints, right? So somewhere upstream of where the two objects are touching, there are two rotational joints and your motor neurons are supplying values to those joints, which are commanding those joints to rotate such that these two objects come in contact with one another. So the forces acting at the joints, or at the motor, motorized joints, which are trying to twist the legs towards one another, are being frustrated. They're trying to reach some angle that the motor neurons are asking for, but they're being opposed by the forces applied by the collision detection and resolution. So what does the collision detection and resolution algorithm do at the next time step? More force, right? The joints apply more force. The uh, collision applies more force. Joints apply more force. Collision applies more force. And away you, away you go, right? So um, some of you may have noticed that. There's lots of easy, uh, easy hacks around that. Uh, the simplest thing is just to restrict the range of motion of the joints so that the robot can never uh, self-collide, except, again, for pairs of objects that are attached uh, at a joint. Um, you can also change your environment in such a way that that doesn't, that doesn't happen. But the easiest thing, I think, is just to restrict the joint. The third thing you can do is, when your robot explodes, if you put a position sensor on your robot, typically that position sensor will report very, very positive or very, very negative x, y, or z coordinates because the objects fly in all directions. Right? So you can build into your fitness function something that will penalize robots that travel a long way. Right? So there is proactive constraints. Proactive meaning you're constraining the behavior of the robot. Uh, proactive constraints, you're you're constraining something about the robot before it happens, like restricting the, the joints, or uh, retroactive, which is you let the robot explode or you let the robot do something that you don't want it to do, and then you use sensor information to somehow detect that situation and then select against it. Build it in as a penalty term to your uh, fitness function. 
Okay. Um, one other issue that's come up, um, which is some of you are evolving your robot to perform a pretty challenging task. For example, it might be if we're now looking at the quadruped from the side, you want the robot to jump over uh, a barrier between it and, for example, the light source. This is a pretty challenging task. So if you're trying to evolve your robot to do something and it's not making much progress, you might want to use an incremental approach like, for example, starting by placing a small barrier very close to the robot, making sure that everything's working, it can actually get over uh, this, it can succeed in this trivial environment. If you're able to evolve a robot that does that, stop the simulation or stop the evolutionary run, change the environment, make it slightly more challenging, run evolution again, and so on. Right? We've seen a few projects so far that have this sort of incremental approach where they try and evolve the robot to do something uh, simple and then gradually make the task more, more difficult. You can do that all within one evolutionary run. So for example, you could say uh, when your evolutionary algorithm reaches 100 generations, change the environment. When it re uh, reaches 200 generations, change the environment again, and so on. But the easiest thing, I think, is just do an entire evolutionary run Make sure the robot can evolve to succeed in that environment. Make the environment slightly more challenging. Run evolution again, and so on and so forth. Right? We're not looking in for, for your final project to demonstrate that you've evolved a robot that does something really challenging. What we're really looking for is that you're approaching this problem from a principled point of view. Right? Even if you don't get to a robot that's able to run towards a very tall object and jump over it, if you at least show us that you're making progress towards that final task, that's, that's what we're looking for. Okay, any other questions about the final project? <coughs> no? Yes? Um, so, I actually have thought that uh, with, uh, in order to uh, prevent uh, kind of robots from touching themselves, yes. we can restrict uh, Yes. But if we restrain the uh, the range of the joint, then uh, then uh, like beforehand, the robot can move quicker than now. Uh, that's a good point, right? So if you restrict the range of motion, maybe the robot slows down. So you can speed up the uh, you can speed up the motors by doing what? By having the options. The. It's not the alpha, it's the tau, value. the tau value, right? Remember, this is how rapidly a neuron changes. So if you increase, I'm sorry, uh, if you increase the tau value for the motor neurons, you speed up the rate of change of the motor neurons, which will change, will speed up the uh, rotation of your motorized joints. And if you reconcile that with the joint range, you should, be, you, you should be able to narrow the joint range, but speed up the motion. So for example, if you wanted something like jumping, even with a relatively restricted range of motion, you should be able to get hopping or, or jumping or whatever energetic movement you're, you're looking for. Any other questions? OK, so let's uh, get back to lecture. Um, we're going to finish off lecture 22 today, where we're looking at the uh, evolution of communication, and we will then start in on the final theme uh, of this course, which is, as I told you at the beginning of the, of the semester, what evolutionary algorithms are particularly well suited to, which is optimizing both the brain and the body of the robot together. Right? Most machine learning algorithms that are out there at the moment, they're assuming a fixed body, like a drone or an autonomous car, and trying to optimize a controller for that fixed machine. But that, of course, is not how Mother Nature operates. She sculpts all aspects of uh, the organism's phenotype, which is body and brain, together. It's a pretty challenging task, and we'll look at a relatively large number of experiments that have attempted to do this uh, well. Okay, so back to lecture 22, the evolution of communication. Just to remind you, uh, we're dealing with this, this discrete uh, toroidal grid. We have female and male agents. The females are immobile but emit or uh, uh, evolve to emit certain signals. Males can move 
and they can hear these signals and they can react or they can evolve to react in certain ways to signals that they hear when they enter the signaling radius of a female agent. Okay. Uh, we looked at the neural networks last time. The output layer of the female is the uh, signal, and that signal is supplied at the input layer of the male network, and whatever arrives at the output layer is how the male agent moves. Okay. So we sort of, again, this is an older experiment, so we're, we're looking at tables of results here. We were looking at how, what fraction of males move in when they hear particular songs. So in this experiment here, the output layer of the female networks and the input layer of the male networks had three binary neurons. Okay, we saw what happened is we actually saw the evolution of communication. We had a situation where males tended to move forward and females would detect males that entered their territory and when the male reached either the same column or the same row as a female, she would detect that, change her song, and males that had evolved the ability to change their movement when they hear that particular song would turn left or turn right. The female would detect the fact that the male had turned. She would stop that particular song or switch to another song, and the male would do what the male does best, which is just walk forward. Right? Okay. Okay, we're going to look at a second experiment now. Everything is exactly the same as before. There is only a single change here, which is now the output layer of the female network and the input layer of the male network only has two neurons. So they're restricting the, the number of songs that the female can uh, emit, which is now four songs, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. Four possible uh, signals, and for each of those four signals, there are four things that the male can do. Stay still, go forward, turn left, or turn right. By restricting the number of songs, they were able to create this large table here, which shows exactly what every single one of the 800 male uh, agents are doing at a given point in time in the experiment. So this is what all 800 male agents were doing at the start of this experiment. Here's how to read this table. If we take a particular element here, like 7 colon 2 1 0 0, each of the four uh, digits here represents how the male responds to one of the four songs. So the first digit is first song, second digit, second song, third digit, third song, fourth digit, fourth song, and the actual digit is between zero and three, which indicates which of the three actions the males uh, performed in this case. Number to the left of the colon is the total number of males that performed these four actions in response to these four signals. So what is this element here telling us? So there's seven males. What are those seven males doing? Not two of them. What does the two here, to, just to the right of the colon, represent? Exactly. So remember that the first of these four digits represents what these seven males did when they hear the first song. This digit here, the second digit, represents what these seven males do when they hear the second song. Right? Jack? So what those values after the colon? That's just a formatting error. That just means all zeros. Oh, okay. yep. So this is all zeros. This is all zeros. OK, so there are seven males that turn left. Two represents turn left. Uh, I lost it here. Here we go. Two, uh, there are seven males that turn left if they hear the first song, which is zero, zero. Uh, the seven of them will go forward if they hear the second song, which is zero, one. And if they hear the third song or the fourth song, they will stay still. What are these four males doing in the upper left element of this matrix? They're staying still regardless of which of the four songs they hear. 
What are the six males doing in the bottom right cell of this matrix? They're always going right regardless of what they hear, uh, w regardless of which of the four signals they, they hear. If any, right? remember the males can also be outside of the signaling radius of a female, uh, in which case they just go straight. Okay, so at time zero, we get what we expect, which is a more or less uniform distribution of males that are doing lots of different things when they hear these different songs. Okay, like the first experiment, we're now going to march through this second experiment to see whether the evolution of communication occurs. This is 8,000 time steps into the experiment. What has happened to most of these clusters of males? They've died off, right? So a zero represents that there are zero, uh, there are zero males in that particular category. Right? We're starting to see some clumping here. So there are 131 males over here that go forward in three, when they hear three out of the four songs, but when they hear the third song, they turn left. The fact that there's 131 of them, what does that tell you? We're showing the males here, right? We're not showing what the 800 females are doing, but you can kind of infer that from the distribution of male behaviors. They were, if there's a lot of them, they must have been successful in finding the female much more than these other groups. Why? What else must have been true in order for them to be finding females at a much higher rate than the other males? They were performing. What the females wanted, wanted them to perform, right? So this shows that there is, again, evolution on both sides. If you want the evolution of communication, you need the evolution of a consistent signaler in this case the females, that know when to emit which song. And you also need the evolution of a consistent listener who knows what to do when they hear the appropriate signal. Right? So this must tell us here that there are a significant number of females in this environment that know exactly when to emit song, uh, the third song. Did it have to be the third song? What's special about the third song? Hey, they turn left, so maybe they go in like a circle? It could be, right? So it's probably something like what we saw before, right? The female is detecting that the male is on the same column or row as her, in the, emits the third song until the, the male keeps turning left until what happens? It's kind of in the direction of the next female. That's right. Not the next female, the female that's emitting the song, right? Yeah. If you're a female, you definitely don't want to be uh, emitting a song that leads a male to another female, which is possible. That those females were probably not very evolutionarily successful. Right? Okay, so we can tell from this clump that we're already getting the evolution of communication, but we can see the largest grouping of males over here, which happen to be turning right when they hear the second uh, song. So we've got 547 males now with response 1311. It turns out that they were responding to females that only ever emit song one or two. Those females never emit song three or four. Why not? Why don't the females bother emitting song three or four? Why? Right? It doesn't mean anything to the listeners, in this case the males. The females can attract the males successfully with just the use of those, those two songs. All you need is turn left or turn right and go forward. Right? That's about all you need in this relatively simplified uh, world. So again, what's special about song one and two? Why not songs, why did the females not evolve to use song two or three or three or four? They could have just as easily, right? So the word for jump in English is J-U-M-P, right? Why J-U-M-P to represent jump? That could possibly be the case, right? I'm not a professional linguist. Maybe you're, maybe you're right. Who knows, right? Most of the time, our choice of language is relatively arbitrary. It doesn't matter what you choose, as long as your signal is consistent, and as long as the listener does what you would, quote unquote, like them to do under those, those conditions. Okay. 
All right, 10,000 time steps into the experiment. We see that this group over here is sort of slowly starting to die off, and there is the emergence of another group of males over here, which are responding to females that emit only songs three and four. And we can see that these 127 males go straight when they hear the third song and turn right when they hear the fourth song. So now we have two groups of females that have evolved two different languages. Again, languages in, in quotes here. Right? Language one is composed of uh, signals one and two. And language two is composed of signals three and four. And there are two, also two groups of males. One group of males which understand, quote unquote, language one, and another group of males, so 613 males who, they don't speak this language, they understand it. 613 who understand language one, and 127 males that understand language two. This is not the end of this experiment. What do you think is going to happen as we keep marching further forward into this experiment. Possibly, right? So we now have two, the emergence of two languages. That's one possibility which could actually happen. It's not what happened here. If you're a male and you're traveling in this environment and there are two groups of females that speak different languages, from an evolutionary point of view, it's in your interest to it would be very advantageous to be bilingual. All right. I noticed that like above the 613, yes. there's, three, there's 321 males who decided to go left. Yes. How come that, is there a reason for that number to just consistently be lower? It's not clear from this picture. So there's 321 of them, which means this is probably not a coincidence, mm -hmm. right? It's, there are two possible hypotheses here to explain this group. What are they? It's probably not random chance. The fact that there's 321 of them mean they're responding to some group of females consistently. Which group? Which group of females? Do you think this group of 321 here are responding to the females that speak that speak language two? Maybe the females are bilingual. It's possible, right? They may actually be able to detect by looking at which way the, the males turn. Let's have a look here. Let's have a, go back and have a look at the network. You'll notice that the network has recurrent connections here in the female network. What does that tell you about the females? They can remember. Now, whether they evolved to do so is not clear. So a female may be able to, how far did we get here? Uh, the female may be able to detect that a particular male that's entered her territory turned left when she emitted song two or turned right when she emitted song two. They may be, the female might be able to distinguish between males that belong to different groups. That's one possibility. Also, two strong groups of females that, you know, they're still using the same first two you know, spots, but right. one tells you to go left and one to go right. It's possible. Maybe there's two dialects, right? So maybe there's two subgroups of females. That's the second hypothesis. The third one is that these males are simply responding to the, the first group of females, and that first group of females will simply emit song two until the male is facing her, right? That may require one turn to the right or three turns to the left, right? Doesn't may not matter from the females. This, uh, the data in the paper doesn't give us enough information to disambiguate between these hypotheses, so we're not, we're not sure. Whatever is going on, there's some interesting uh, dynamics going on in the evolution of communication. OK. Now we're at 12 time steps, 12,000 time steps in, and we see that now there is a growing group down here. 128 males that respond correctly to both female groups, right? One, three, one, three. So we have now a group that's bilingual. We have our, we have our basically three groups of males now, one that speak language one, or sorry, one that understands 
language one, the second group understands language two, and the third group understands both languages. What is going to happen as we continue to move through this experiment? It makes sense, right? Have a look at the top, the top uh, table. We've got 217 bilingual males. Uh, it actually drops a little bit here. We now have 155 males at 16,000 time steps. At 20,000 time steps, we have 517 bilingual males. By 30,000 time steps, the group that spoke only the second language have gone extinct. And we have our poor male dodo bird here, the last one in existence that only speaks language one. You can imagine what's going to happen to that male. This is the situation at 40,000 time steps. So regardless of whether you're male or female, if you uh, have given up on language classes here at UVM and you only speak English, take a, take a page from our male and female uh, agents here. So uh, this is not actually an evolutionary robotics experiment. Of course, we're looking at these sort of disembodied agents moving in this, this grid world. Why did we spend this lecture talking about this abstract study of the evolution of communication? It's a possibility for how, how we might be able to develop. It's a possibility, right? So it suggests a hypothesis about what might happen in biological species in which signaling and then communication evolves. Here was sort of a cooked example, right? There was a very good reason for males to evolve the ability to respond appropriately to, uh, to female signaling. Why else is language important? Why, why did we have a look at this experiment at this point in the course? The lions and the gazelle, right? So in the previous experiment we looked at with the vir four virtual lions and the gazelle, the lions could not speak or understand each other, right? They could see what their fellow teammates were doing, but they could not tell their fellow teammates what they were about to do, right? So throughout this course, we've looked at a number of the building blocks of intelligence. I've gone out of my way to try and not define what intelligence is. This has been one of the stumbling blocks for artificial intelligence research for decades. Instead, we're focusing on specific building blocks of intelligence and trying to understand two things about those building blocks. What are the conditions under which they will evolve? And how would they be useful in a practical robotics setting? Right? If we wanted a large group of robots to help out at a, at a construction site, it might be useful for those robots to communicate with one another their intentions, plans, choices, uh, and so on. Okay. Any questions about this experiment before we move on? Yes. So the one thing that's like arbitrary, if this ran again, you could get any of this error off. Absolutely, right? It's arbitrary. If we, re -round, if we rewound the tape of human evolution, would you get English and Spanish and Mandarin? Probably not, right? Historical accident. The specific components of the language don't matter, just as long as a signaler can emit something that is useful both to the person who's emitting the signal and the person who hears it, or the organism or the robot that hears it. Okay. Okay, so that concludes our discussion of collective robotics. Now we're going to turn to evolving both the body plan and controller uh, of robots. Uh, again, like many of the uh, topics we've discussed in this class, the first attempts to do so uh, were done in the mid 90s, and we're going to gradually walk forward um, until our last lecture in this segment, which looks at soft robotics. We're going to have a guest lecturer here, Nick Cheney, who's currently a PhD student and also took this class as an undergraduate 
uh, a couple of years ago. Um, Nick just heard that he received a faculty position at the University of Wyoming. He's not leaving until the summer, so he'll be here to tell you a little bit about evolving bodies and brains of soft uh, robots. Okay, so let's have a look at the first attempt to evolve robot bodies and brains carried out by uh, Carl Sims. I will show you the video of this first. Um, this was work that was done back in 1994. This demonstration shows virtual creatures that were evolved. Okay, I apologize, the sound isn't so good, so I will try and narrate this here. Um, obviously, these are uh, virtual uh, robots. I said this was carried out in 1994. I told you there were no physics engines until 2000. Sims actually created his own, wrote his own physics engine to do this experiment back in 1994. Pretty impressive. Uh, this was really sort of the first physics engine. Pretty impressive physics engine as well. What are some of the properties of these evolved body plans? Some of them are random collections of blocks, but others are not necessarily random. What are some of the patterns you see here? Most of them are one leg or have some kind of leg hinge arm leg. Arm leg, there's some sort of... So there's always usually an appendage somehow. You get peristalsis, right? Some traveling wave along a lot of these appendages. We've seen that before. Artificial evolution tends to discover that. Bilateral symmetry, right? We've seen that before. Some of you are working on the evolution of jumping. Phototaxis. No flying. They've turned off the graph. They've turned off gravity. It's more swimming, right? So when when one of these blocks pushes, there's an opposing force that pushes the body in the opposite direction. Competition. <laughs> The evolution of aggression, perhaps. <clears throat> Counter strategies. That is a good strategy. <laughs> Unless somebody else does the same thing. <laughs> this is my favorite one. Forget the block altogether and just. <laughs> Maybe you just get frustrated and go home. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, pretty impressive back in 1994 and still somewat impressive almost 30, 30 plus years, years later. So, I've just aired the dirty laundry of our field, evolutionary robotics. There was this amazing advance made back in 1994, and all of us since then have been trying to build upon Carl Sims' original uh, achievement. Okay, we'll come back to a lot of these creatures 
throughout the rest of this, this lecture. Okay, um, this was evolved back in the uh, mid-90s on a connection machine, uh, the Connection Machine 5. There were a series of these uh, supercomputers that were uh, parallelized. This is the Connection Machine 5 down here. If you go, and watch, go back and watch Jurassic Park, you'll see the CM5 having a cameo uh, in the, the movie. Uh, the CM5 had a peak performance of 131 gigaflops or floating operations per second. Uh, a MacBook, uh, sorry, that should be MacBook Pro, has about 91 gigaflops per second. So the CM5 was on par with a laptop. Not bad. A little bit bigger than a laptop back then, but, but still a pretty powerful machine. You'll notice that it had 10 24 cores, so it was a parallel machine. And they were connected in a hypercube arrangement. So if we take a CPU, if we take two CPU, if we take two CPUs and we allow them to communicate with each other, if we add four and we allow these four to communicate with one another, they're talking to their three nearest neighbors and so on. Why the CM5? The 1024 is the hint here. <coughs> Right, exactly, right. So you have 1024 uh, CPUs that are attached in a hypercube that has a dimension of 5. I think that's right, yeah. Okay, so pretty powerful. Uh, Carl Sims first created his own physics engine and then was evolving his virtual robots in that physics engine. Uh, population size of 300, ran it for 100 generations, which with this massive parallelism he was able to finish in about three hours, a single run in three hours. So pretty impressive for the time, and again, still relatively impressive. Okay, let's look under the hood of exactly what he was doing. So you've already seen the phenotypes. The robots were made up of collections of rectangular uh, solids. And the genotypes, we've seen lots of different kinds of genotypes in this course. Uh, you've been encoding your synaptic weights in matrices. We, looked, uh, we just looked at a genetic programming application in which the genotypes were encoded as trees. Carl Sims also encoded his genotypes in trees, but these were actually uh, not just trees, but nested, directed multigraphs. And we'll work our way through those three adjectives. But basically, the genotypes were graphs that were translated into uh, these kinds of phenotypes. So uh, genotype to phenotype mapping, just to remind you, is this process by which we take an abstract data type, data structure, in this case, these multigraphs, and translate it, use it to construct our, our robot. Okay. One of the reasons why, as you'll have noticed in a lot of Sims's creatures, is you got a lot of this repeated pattern and symmetries is because this particular mapping is recursive. It, it tends to add structures in similar ways. And you can sort of get a feel for how this works, especially by looking at this top row here. So each node in the genotype encodes information for creating a single object. So when you visit a node, you construct that object. You then follow each outgoing edge and each edge has a number of labels associated with it. What do you think the labels on those edges represent? Every time we visit a node, we're going to create an object. What would you expect to see on the labels of the edges? Where that object goes in relation to the next Where the new object goes in relation to the original one. So in this case here, we visit this node to begin with. We construct the trunk of this tree. You then follow this edge, and on this edge, it alters uh, aspects of the object so that when we arrive back at the same segment, we're going to create a new segment, but that segment is built relative to the original one. Right? The edge is telling us how to change the position, the current position, orientation, size, and so on, so that when the new object is placed, it's constructed differently from the original object. So let's have a look at this in a little more detail. There are a number of labels on each of these nodes. So again, as you now know from working in physics engines, we need 
the body part dimensions. So we need the x, y, and z, the position of the object center. What else do we need if we're constructing rectangular solids? We need x, y, and z, and length, width, and height. So we've got six labels associated with the node already. We also have joint information as well. So the first time we visit this node, we're just constructing an object. When we follow an edge and come back here, we're constructing a second object. And there's information in this node here about how to connect the current object to the parent object. We go back, like we follow the edge backwards. Right? So we're also connecting objects together as we move through this uh, genus tag. We'll talk about recursive limit uh, in a moment. Again, as we just talked about, the edges also have uh, information about how to change. So when we're here, we collect an X, Y, Z, and an L, W, and H. When we follow this link, there is information about how to change X, Y, and Z, and how to change length, width, and height, and also orientation. Right? Remember, we also need to orient our object in in space. We haven't talked, I, I skipped over how to place a rectangular solid in three-dimensional space. There are actually four numbers that you need to do that, and those four numbers are encoded in a quaternion. We're not going to talk about quaternions in this class, but we do have now x, y, z, length, width, and height, and four additional numbers which indicate the orientation of the object. So if we look at this object compared to this one, it's got a slightly different orientation. It's also slightly smaller, and it's also got, obviously, a different position. Uh, it, so we can change the position when we follow an edge. There's information about changing the orientation, changing the scale, changing the length, width, and height. We also built in a few binary flags to try and increase the chances of symmetry. So reflection would mean if you created an object like this, when you follow an edge and if you come back, flip the new one along some axis of symmetry. So you start to get symmetry in your genotype. Okay. We now come to this additional binary flag, terminal only flag. Um, let's talk about recursive limit here. So if we are starting by visiting this node, constructing an object, following its outgoing edges and arriving, and arriving at other nodes. If we have self edges like this, if we have no recursive limit, what's going to happen? It'll draw an inf a tree with, in, in the top case, it'll draw a tree with an infinite number of twigs. It'll be pretty hard to simulate in a physics engine. So we need to place, uh, uh, we need to place an integer inside each node and every time that node is vis visited, we decrement that uh, integer by one. And when that integer gets to zero, if we visit that edge, if we visit that node and RL equals zero, we stop. So, is, so it's like setting the depth limit on the node. Absolutely, right? We're setting a depth limit, right? So uh, our tree here has a recursive limit of one, two, three, four, five. If a mutation took RL equals 5 and changed it to RL equals 6, what would the child tree look like? We'd get two more branches from the end of each. That's right. We'd get one more depth of our tree. Right? We haven't talked about this creature yet, but there is also a recursive limit in here um, of 3. If that recursive limit was increased to 4, what would the parent, uh, what would the child of this parent look like? Not necessarily longer legs. That would be a change to the length inside a node. If we change the recursive limit in, in this genotype is three. If it was increased to four, what would the child look like? It would have another body type that would come off of that. It would have a fourth segment here with legs, which we'll get to in a, in a moment. Okay. So let's go back to the edges. So the edges have this final binary uh, flag associated with them, and evolution can change that flag, set it to 0 or 1. 
The terminal only flag means if you're traveling along this edge, you're traveling along a particular edge, and the parent, let's say we're traveling along this edge here, the parent recursive limit is zero. That means follow this edge. Otherwise, don't follow this edge, stop and go, go back. What that allows evolution to do is to create certain objects that are only created when we've reached a recursive limit. I don't think we can see that here. What's, what's possible is when creating the upper and lower arm, for example, in this humanoid robot, there is an additional node in the genotype which will specify another object, which is the hand. And that hand will only be created when the recursive limit of this node is, is reached. Make sense? Okay, let's build up a little bit of an intuition for how this works. Let's have a look at this one here. We can see that there are two nodes that make up this genotype. One which is body segment and one which is leg segment. And if you look here, you can see obviously there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 objects, but only two unique types of objects. So perhaps we start here, we construct this body segment, we then follow these three outgoing edges. You'll notice that there are two outgoing uh, edges here. So in most graphs that you've probably seen, there's only ever one edge connecting pairs of objects together. That's what we mean by a multigraph. So a multigraph can have multiple edges between pairs uh, of nodes. We've constructed, for example, this body segment here. We follow these three outgoing edges. Let's follow the self edge first. We construct this object. We follow this self edge. We come back here. We're going to construct a second object. Which one is it? The one right above it. We create another body segment here. So we follow this edge. We've also had to follow these two edges. So we follow these two edges and we arrive at leg segment but we arrive at leg segment along two different edges. So we're, we're arriving at leg segment twice, which are the two leg segments that are being constructed? Left and right. The left and right, exactly, right? So one of these, the reflection flag is probably set to zero, and in the other edge, the reflection flag is set to one, right? So we're creating the same object with the same length and width and height, but they're reflected about some axis of, of symmetry. What does this self-edge, how, how does this self-edge affect the phenotype? It creates another leg off the upper leg, right? So these pieces are the same. What's the recursive limit uh, inside this node? Two, right? If it was mutated to three, what would happen to the phenotype? What would happen to the legs? So they have another leg segment, right? So you'd have a leg that's made up of three segments, right? Change the recursive limit here, you add a whole new uh, segment to the overall robot. Make sense? Okay. So I've walked you through two of these three adjectives now. We now know why this is a multigraph, why we have multiple edges between pairs of objects. Uh, it's directed. We need these edges uh, to direct us from one node to the other. We haven't talked about the, the fact that it's nested. So it turns out that this genotype has, uh, the genotype is a graph, and inside each node is nested another graph. What do you think, the, which we're not showing in this picture yet, what do you think the graph inside each of these nodes uh, represents? Where else have you seen graphs in this class? The neural network, right? So there are two levels to the genotype. There is the upper level here, which dictates how to build the body. And as we are using the information here and traversing through this uh, graph to build the body, there are also graphs inside which are telling us how to build neural structure in each piece 
of this body as we go. Okay, we'll come back to that in a moment. What I'd like you to do is to turn to your neighbor. You have a choice of 12 different robots here. The phenotype, you got the 12 phenotypes. See if you can sketch out the genotype that produced this phenotype. You don't have to go into detail about writing down the actual x, y, and z and the recursive limit. See if you can just get the number of nodes right and which nodes connect to which other nodes to produce these phenotypes. You can pick one or a couple, see how you do. I'll give you a couple minutes to do that, and we'll see what you came up with. Okay, what did you come up with? Any ideas? Number nine is really easy. Number nine is really easy. Why is number nine really easy? It just has a body and then one line for the tail that has a little tail description. So how many nodes in the genotype that specifies robot nine? Two. One for the main body and one for the tail. And the tail probably has a recursive limit of three. Right? Or two if we're counting from zero. And number eight just has one node with one of the Probably, right? It looks like eight probably just has one, uh, one node. Now, it may not be one node because you'll notice that there's a bit of a pattern here. It's sort of one, two, three, sudden change. One, two, three, sudden change. One, two, three. Sudden change. Yeah, at least possible. For, for me, it kind of looks like it's the same object just rotated. Possible. It's hard, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell from this picture. This one, number seven, is the genotype is probably just one node with a self connection. I would say it was like two were the body nodes that they recur on itself, and then that leads to the tail node because the last two are much. That's true. That's possible, right? Now it may be that the edge, the edge is specifying that the width of the block is reducing faster than the length of the height, which would mean that the blocks are getting more and more narrow as you go. Again, it's hard to tell from, from the cartoon. 
How about uh, robot number three? Typically, three connections, a body, a body node with two reflective connections to a wing node, which is referred to on itself twice, and then one connection to a end wing node. Possibly, right? The tip of these wings might be different from the two internal struts. Again, hard to hard to say. Robot six is kind of interesting. What about the what about the genotype for six? Yeah, we think it has uh, two nodes uh, with an edge between them, and they each have recursive edges. Exactly right. So it looks like there are only two different kinds of objects here, right? There's obviously the the body segment, uh, which has a self link, and every time you follow that self link, it's reflecting or twisting about 90, 90 degrees, right? And then one uh, one node which represents the um, uh, re represents the I don't know what this is appendage right it's hard to say what these things are um, again reflected about either side of the the body right? okay so that's the body as I mentioned there this is a nested graph so there is graph structure inside of each uh, node let's start with this node out here. So here is the phenotype. We can see the phenotype is made up of two different objects. Again, the body segment and the wing, if you like. Here's the body segment, and here's the wing. I know that this is the wing because we have two outgoing edges. So every time a segment is made, there are two additional things that are made and attached to it. OK. Inside the wing, we have J0 and J1, um, which represent joint sensors which you know as proprioceptive sensors. There are two of them, J0 and J1, because in SIMS's implementation, whenever pairs of objects are attached together, they have two degrees of freedom. They can rotate like this, and they can rotate like this, which gives you, if they're moving at the same time, this. So in your case, if we were attaching an object to another object with just a hinge joint, which allows one degree of freedom, we would have only one joint sensor in there. So these two joint sensors are reporting how much the joint is rotated this way and how much the joint is rotated this way. These are not vestibular sensors. What does vestibulation tell you? You have vestibulation in your inner ear. Tilting, right? So this is not tilt. This is the angle of the joint. We have E0 and E1. These are effector neurons, which you know as motor neurons, just different terms for the same, the same thing. So in every single wing, there are two proprioceptive sensors, and there are two motor neurons, which are commanding how much the wing rotates relative to the main body along this axis and how much along this axis. If one of the motor neurons is sending out this pattern and the other motor neuron is always sending out zero, then you get this. If the first motor neuron is always sending out a zero and the second motor neuron is sending out a signal, uh, oscillatory signal, then you get this. If both of them are sending out an oscillatory signal, you'll get something like this, right? Which was pretty common in the videos. So every time we build a wing, and we're going to build a wing four times, we copy these six neurons into the wing. So we have so far six, 12, 18, 24 uh, neurons. Inside the main body are these sorts of strange neurons that have wave, memory, and absolute in them. And then we have an additional dotted, uh, a special node, which is, has this dashed line around it. What do you think this special node represents? As you can see in the phenotype, this node is not, not actually translated into a body segment. This is so all the small neurons, all the small circles here, and all the thin edges, that's all the neural network. The small circles are neurons, and the thin arrows are synapses. So this is all neural network material. What we're trying to figure out is, what does this represent? Is that a CPG? Not quite a CPG. Uh, it's not hidden neurons. So 
whenever we create one of these objects, we're copy copying this neural structure inside into it. So every time we make a body segment, we're copying these three neurons in here, and also these three neurons in here, and we're also copying across all of these arrows. But we have this sort of special node up here, which is never translated into an actual object. And this special node up here has three additional neurons inside it. What does this dotted node represent? Maybe it could have something to do with the evolution of neurons and how things change. Possibly. Oh, I'm going to say it changes the morphology. Not quite the morphology. It, it's, it seems to be representing the morphology because it's one of these bigger nodes. So inside your arm is a patterning of very specific neural structure throughout the length of your arm. That particular neural structure is repeated in your other arm. Same with your legs and so on. So you have neural structure that's repeated throughout your body. But there's one part of your body where there's some neural structure that is only created once. It's unique. Where is it? Right? So these, this is known as the peripheral nervous system, peripheral towards the periphery. And this robot's peripheral system is not that different from your peripheral system. Its wing can sense its angle, and it can respond appropriately based on the current angle. So there's some local sensor motor coordination going on on out here, and also here, well actually, I'm sorry, here, 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 and here. But perhaps it would be useful for this robot to have some centralized control, known as your central nervous system, the CNS, that's sort of the switchboard, right? Maybe there's only so much you can do with local reflexes. Maybe it's useful for all of these sensors to report to some central place, which are the arrows pointing into this dashed node. And then the brain is sending specific commands to different parts of the body. That may or may not be useful for, for evolution. So we've got the peripheral nervous system out here, and then we have the non-local brain available if it's useful for evolution. Did you have a question? OK, so let's come back to the neurons again. So we tend to see these odd uh, names inside of these neurons here. We know what these ones are. These are sensor neurons. These are motor neurons. So all of the rest of these must therefore be, if they're not sensor neurons and not motor neurons, what kind of neurons are they? What's left? Hidden neurons, right? They're hidden from the outside world somehow. They're either receiving sensory input from the outside, and they're sending signals on to the motor neuron, motor neurons. Each of these hidden neurons here have these different labels associated with them, like wave, memory, absolute, and so on. These are the activation functions. So remember that in your project, you're using the tan H function, which just takes all the raw sum and squashes it to a value between minus 1 and plus 1. You don't have to take that raw sum and push it through the, the hyperbolic tangent. You could push it through different kinds of activation functions. We actually saw that already when we talked about the hyperneat algorithm. Uh, you'll notice, for example, there's wave and saw down here, which are producing an oscillating wave pattern or an oscillating saw pattern. That you've also seen that before. What, is, what are those kinds of neurons called? You have them in your spine. The central pattern generators, right? So some of the patterns that you see, some of the motion patterns that you see in Sims's creatures are being dictated by these internal sinusoidal patterns. But the fact that you saw a robot that was performing phototaxis that would swim towards the red light means that it's not just these oscillatory patterns that are producing uh, movement. It's also moving in response to what it senses. Right? It's combining information from the outside world and this internal oscillation to produce rhythmic but directed motion. 
Okay, so here is now this creature. So we, I've drawn the body on the right-hand side. Here's the brain after it's been constructed. So if you look carefully, you should be able to see from wave to plus, wave to plus repeated twice. So those are the two body segments. We have, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, we have our, our um, appendage on either side. And then at the top, we have just this one copy of the centralized brain, right? So as we're traversing through the genotype, we are drawing or constructing this body in the simulator, or SIMS was, and also constructing this neural network as we, as we go. OK. Uh, let's have a look at some of the other aspects of the evolutionary algorithm. He was crossing over two genotypes. Remember when we talked about NEAT and hyperneat, we talked about how difficult it is to take two networks, cut them in half, put the, glue them together, and get a third functioning network. Sims tried to solve this problem by taking his two genotypes, uh, two parent genotypes, arranging them in a line, and then starting with one parent, copying the genetic material from parent one into the child, and at random points, uh, he would cross over to the other parent, keep walking along and copying now the genetic material from parent two into the child, keep walking, randomly jump back to the other parent and copy that genetic material into the child. So again, we now get a child genotype, which is some genetic combination of the two parents. My bet is that that didn't usually work very well for the reasons we talked about when we talked about NEAT and HyperNEAT, the competing inventions problem. Uh, anyways, he tried that and tried some other things like grafting here. So we take two parents now and we create a connection between them. We copy along here and then again follow this link and follow and copy some backlinks as we go. Just different ways of genetically combining material from two parents into a child. Okay. You saw in the video locomotion, you saw phototaxis. We're pretty familiar with those. We just finished talking about uh, collective behavior. So we saw these two robots that were competing over a common resource, this cube in the middle. Let's talk about this particular task for a moment. Um, we take two creatures out of the population, put them on either side of the cube. The creatures had to exist inside of their starting zone, so they couldn't uh, when we're constructing the phenotype, the phenotype couldn't exist in front of this dotted line. And it, the body could also not grow to be above this di upwardly sloping diagonal line. Why did he put that in there? Exactly, right? Remember our discussion about perverse instantiation, right? You can't, the easiest thing would be to just grow very tall and very heavy and fall on the, the object, right? So it's got to start low and either get to the cube or do something, do something else. Okay. What is the fitness function for these competing robots? Okay. So I touch the cube. I'm creature one. I touch the cube, and so does creature two. First. Okay. We could build in time. We could see which one touches it first. Possibly get the cube inside your starting zone. So there were some of the creatures that would actually grab it and pull it back towards their side. That's a possibility. So if I am creature one, here's my fitness function. So I want to minimize my distance to the object. So here's my distance to the object. There's a minus sign in front of it. I want to minimize my distance to it. So I want this negative number to be as small as possible. And I also want to maximize the distance between the object and my competitor, robot two, right? And then we just normalize that. So as creature one, my fitness is how close I am to the object and how far my competitor is from the object, right? Remember some of these creatures sort of ran around the object and were actively pushing the other creature away from the, the block. Right? Fitness function for creature two is the flip of that. Right? Okay, so that's all well and good. 
But how do we actually do this if we have pairs of robots and their fitness is not absolute, right? It's relative to what my competitor is doing. So how am I actually going to compute the fitness of every individual in the population? Well, I could take my population here. So now every robot is represented by a circle. And an edge represents one simulation where I placed those two robots inside a simulation to see how well they do. So I could compete in panel A there at the top every robot against every other robot and take the average of my ability against all the other competitors in the population. Probably the best way to estimate fitness for any individual in the population, but not what Sims actually ended up doing. Why not? What's that? It's drastically inefficient. How inefficient is it? You're going to keep hitting robots that don't even know what you mean when you hit them the first time. Possibly. So not inefficient in that way. Inefficient in what way? How many simulations would I have to run if I had a population of n robots? n squared, right? Or n squared divided by 2 because it's symmetric, right? So that's going to take quite a while. So maybe I want to do something else, which is just I randomly pair up individuals and compute fitness that way. How many simulations do I need to run now? And over two. Really computationally efficient. That's also not what Sims did. Why not? What's the point? What is the point? You're not going to have enough crowds to know who. It's not a really good way of estimating individuals' fitness, right? So. We just finished March Madness, right, in basketball. Let's, let's do March Madness here. Let's pair up individuals, and the winner of each individual competition goes on to the next round, and so on and so forth. And your fitness is your average fitness along this path, or however long, however far along this path you get. What's the problem with round robin? It's also not what you did. Why not? Uh, certain robots that might not have been uh, placed against each other would have had certain advantages that were never exploited. Right, advantages or disadvantages, right? Imagine by chance we teamed up initially the best robot against the second best robot. The second best robot in the population, which we would have known if we had done the full competition, loses to the best robot gets a relatively low fitness and is bred out of the population too early. Right? Here's what Sims actually did, which is in the first generation, he did all versus all competition. So he got a very good estimate of every robot in the population. At the second generation, he knew exactly who was the best here. He competed all the new robots only against the best one. How many simulations do we need to run in this case? N minus one simulation. So it's computationally efficient. And we have a pretty good estimate, actually, of the fitness of every robot in the population. Why? Why do we not need to, for example, perform this competition? It's all relative based on one robot. If you can do well against the best robot in the population, that's a pretty good estimate of how good you are probably in, in general. It's not perfect. Because as you saw in the video, there are a lot of different kinds of strategies. So strategy A may be good against strategy B. Strategy B may be good against strategy C. Strategy C may be good against strategy A, but not the other way around, right? Paper, rock, scissors. OK, um, that's one possibility. Another thing you could do is actually create two different populations, team A and team B. And we always compete one individual against an individual from another population. So uh, again, if we, have a, if we have a situation where there are lots of diverse strategies that we might like to evolve, and you could see from the video that there were lots of diverse strategies, maybe we want to separate these populations a little bit. Otherwise, as you probably saw when you did the genetic algorithm assignment, everybody tries to con tends to converge on more or less the same strategy. So by breaking the population up, 
maybe these robots uh, evolve to grab the object and pull it back to their side. Maybe members of this team evolve to ignore the block altogether and run towards their competitor and push their competitor away from the, the block, right? We can maintain these different strategies by dividing our population into subpopulations. For those of you that are trying to evolve two or more robots either to work together or to compete against one another, there's some interesting ideas in this paper for you. Okay, I think we're out of time, so we'll leave it there for today. You have a quiz due tonight, and you're working on your next deliverable, which will be due next Monday night. Uh, have a good rest of your day.